Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Marilyn Shannon, and this is the Breaking Free Show, and I welcome you here. It's always a pleasure to have you, and it's an honor that you spend your time with us. And today we have a full show and one that you will remember forever. And I'm sure you're going to go back and watch it again and share it with your friends because it's going to be impactful on many levels. But before we get started, I just want to say hi to Amnon. Hello. How are you? Busy over there, I'm right? I'm fine. Busy over here. I know. I'm not so busy getting the show it's ready. It's a nice day today. It's a beautiful day in the yeah. neighborhood. It is. And I'm feeling better. My cold is better. So I am very excited. So with that, I'm going to introduce my guests to you. We have four of them. And they are my heroes because they're speaking out. They're speaking up. They're speaking out. And they're speaking for something that is so timely and so important. And, you know, it defines the Breaking Free show. I was listening to a video by uh, Kim Goodsell, who is one of our guests, and I watched this and I had to take a picture of it because I love the line. Every generation must protest against the established order of authority. And that is exactly why I do the show. Because I think we, not I think, I know, we need to take the power and we need to do what's right for ourselves, our families, and each other. So with that, let me get started by introducing my guests. So we have John Kostick and Dana Lewis, and they represent Night Scout Project, which is a remote monitoring system for diabetic. Now, John is the father of a son who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and a software engineer and shifted his whole life to make sure that his son was taken care of. Dana Lewis uh, is the creator of DIYPS, the do-it-yourself pancreas system and founder of the Open APS movement, which she's going to get into more of that. Then we have uh, Kim Goodsell. She was a, she was a, she's an athlete, ran, biked, did everything she possibly could do outside. You're going to see Kim, and she's still outside. And ah. she was diagnosed with th threatening, in, in, threatening information and told no time left. And what did she do? She take, took it on herself, and she figured out what she actually had. And then we have Joyce Lee, who is a pediatrician, but above all, she's a mother with two children who have issues, two, two kids who are, you know, needing her support. And so I want to have each and every one of them go through more about what they do, and we're going to get on with sharing exactly how they're doing it and what, what is it about that we need to change a culture, the medical culture, and educate each and every one of us. So we're going to start with John. John, will you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Um, thanks for inviting me today. Um, I'm currently lead software engineer at the University of Rochester, a newer center called the Center for Cl Clinical Innovation. So four years ago when, when Evan was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, we found that the technology was sort of deficient, but the underlying technology to do what we needed for him existed. So after putting together you know, what would become the, the Night Scout system and project, uh, that has sort of led me to, to being able to do this full time across many different uh, conditions. So that, that, that's where I'm at today, and it's, it's been quite a surreal and interesting several years. <laughs> right. And John, and through John's work, he's been able to help his son. So that's really important. And then, Dana, what about you? Well, like John's son, Evan, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at, the, for me, the age of 14. So I grew up through my teen and college years with diabetes. And I'm really healthy. I took really good care of myself. But the technologies were really frustration. Um, I had a lot of frustrations with the technology, the main one being that the continuous glucose monitor that I had did not wake me up in my sleep if my blood sugar was too low. And I had this idea, if I could only get the data off the CGM, I could make louder alarms, I could do all kinds of things. And it wasn't until I found John tweeting about the innovation he had done for his son and asked him, would he be willing to share this code with myself and my then boyfriend, that I then really got into this world of open source and do-it-yourself diabetes. But that's what happened is John shared his code. I built this louder alarm system I called DIYPS, jokingly. 
but it ultimately turned into a true do-it-yourself closed-loop artificial pancreas that can auto-adjust my insulin pump. And my idea was I can do this for myself, but this could also help other people. So like John before me had shared code, I wanted to find a way to do it open source. And so that's what led from me switching from DIYPS, Dana's personalized pancreas system pretty much, to open APS, which is the open source artificial pancreas movement. And so that's why I spent a lot of my time focusing today, which is how can we bring a lot of this diabetes technology to open source so that people who do want to do it themselves can do so. Perfect. And then what about you, Kim? Well, thank you, Marilyn, for inviting me to the show. And I am so honored to be with um, the guests that you've invited. Um, although they are in the diabetes community, I'm in the rare disease community. And um, we echo, or I echo, the cry, we're not waiting. And uh, in my situation, I was diagnosed with um, a complex of two life-threatening rare diseases, and actually three. Um, in a host of autoimmune diseases, and I had, I had always been an athlete, um, a bit of an extreme athlete, spent most of my life in the wilderness, and I just hit the wall in 2010 um, after being diagno diagnosed with all of these different diseases. Um, I was told to, that there was no actionable plan, there was nothing that could be done about it, and I was sent home and told that I could take pain medication or I and or return in a year to measure the rate of degeneration. I have a uh, degenerative, I actually have a, I, I discovered the genetic, um, the genetic cause, uh, which was an umbrella over all of these uh, different rare diseases. And in the, con in the, in the, in the, um, in the end, it ended up that I made a significant contribution to genetic medicine, and so I became known as the patient of the future. I have an honorary degree in the uh, University of uh, Google Medicine, and uh, my my paper, my actually my science has been accepted for publication in peer-reviewed um, journal of electrophysiology. So um, I'm sort of the face, the new face in medicine, the the Google and Go patient. It's I mean, it's, seriously, it's just incredible what you're, I mean, all that you're all doing by open sourcing, by discovering your own connections in, in your own illnesses, it's phenomenal. So Joyce, what about you? Yeah, so I'm a pediatric endocrinologist and I work mostly with kids with type 1 diabetes. My own two kids actually have food allergies and so... Um, I'm not as like technically savvy as the rest, so all I did was make a series of YouTube videos to sort of help educate our caregivers about um, how to manage the, the food allergies and how to manage the medication, the EpiPens. But um, I think what I've had the opportunity or privilege to do is really explore this whole notion of patient-centered design and participatory design and kind of view and understand how um, patients can really bring innovation to the healthcare enterprise. So, in particular, I, you know, I'm, I, I sort of live inside the type one diabetes community as a clinician, and so um, have been doing a lot of research with Dana and John and the Night Scout community, um, just trying to understand how it came about. I mean, I think there's a couple really remarkable things about um, Night Scout in particular that we've discovered, and one is, I mean, it's obvious, right? But it's basically patients creating solutions because no one else is going to make them for them, right? Like, they're not going to wait for us clinicians. They're not going to wait for us regulators, right? So one, it's just this notion that um, patients have the expertise and the insights to understand what problems need to be solved. Um, and then two, they go ahead and just do it with, you know, computer code, open source code, really interesting hardware solutions being developed for glucose sensing that are not necessarily FDA approved, but that people are experimenting with and sort of pushing the boundaries with um, artificial pancreas systems that are do-it-yourself that don't even exist on the commercial market, right, because none are FDA approved, but people are leveraging them to sort of really benefit their health um, from a bottom-up perspective. Um, and then finally, just this whole notion of social media. So um, the fact that everyone found each other through a closed Facebook group, um, and now there's sort of this big online global community of patients that are sharing that goes well beyond whatever their healthcare delivery systems offer them or um, kind of the dismal tools that exist right now for diabetes in the enterprise. So. Um, I would say that I'm a clinician who's really supportive of uh, what Kim and John and Dana have been doing, and I'm sort of interested in trying to, one, learn from their lead user innovations to try and 
to try and introduce them back into healthcare delivery and or also just kind of at a, at a grassroots level sort of support this notion that everyone's a maker of their health and so we should be really um, supporting that in a fundamental way from inside the healthcare enterprise. Thank you, Joyce. I, I love the line. I mean, I've been thinking about your line since I've been studying you a little bit. We are experts because we really are. I mean, we each of us know our bodies. We know how we feel. We are experts. I mean, who's to say we're not? So I, I, I love the movement. So what's, what is, where do we start? Or not start, but where are we going from here? Like, what is it you need? What do we, what do we need to teach? What do we need to show? I mean, what do we need to do? So I think we need, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. no, go right ahead. Well, I think we need to, to help dispel the disbelief that patients are capable of um, innovation and of research. And uh, I think we're all the face of that. And we, we are empowered with so many tools today and, you know, unlimited information. And I mean, I conducted very high level research that ended up in a peer review publication from a remote area at the tip of Baja while I was kiteboarding and you know there's dusty streets and it's you know this tiny little fishing village and I was able to perform some really sophisticated research so you know that's the kind of power we have today and I think we need to um, encourage this whole notion of patient as as expert, patient as maker, and patient as collaborator, because it, it truly it's it's the future of medicine, and it has it's in our hands. I mean, right now we have uh, the latest publication. The news is out that medical treatment is the third leading cause of death. I mean, it, you know, clearly. We, we, it really is our responsibility. We have to take responsibility for our health. And pharmaceuticals are the fourth. So, you know, we, we, we really need to, to get people to, to take over their health and, and stop, you know, turning it over to the paternal system of medical. You know, I, I mean, to be a collaborator with that. I, I work in and collaborate. I've had fabulous physicians at the Mayo Clinic that, that gave me all my data. I mean, no questions asked, but outside of that, the Mayo system, I found it very difficult to obtain my records. I've been um, testifying with the FDA when they, uh, you know, were trying to establish uh, the, it's a, it, well, actually, John, you would probably have a better take on this. Uh, I have a device as well. I have um, a cardiac defibrillator implanted, and I don't have access to that real-time data. And what I could do with that data could be so valuable to me, but the industry does not allow, they consider that their customer is the electrophysiologist, not the patient. And so I don't have access to that data, and, and it, it, it's actually put me at risk. Um, and because my device has failed a few times, and what that means is I, I get inappropriately shocked, which is like a bomb going off in your chest. This isn't some nice treatment. This is a very radical treatment that occurs when I, when I go into a, to a cardiac failure. That's fine, but to get it inappropriately, it actually is so powerful that it, knocks me, it can knock me off my feet. And so uh, my, the situation that occurred just uh, a couple of years ago it occurred, I, I went down to Mexico and I was in a very remote area and alarms started going off in my chest and it was the device warning me that it was failing. I had to make a long distance call to the Mayo Clinic and they you know, said, well, your nearest place and you've got to get to it immediately because your device is failing <laughs> or, and you're going to start getting inappropriately shocked with 18 hours away. So. Had I had the diagnostic, the device diagnostics, which was the technology is there, it's being collected in a box and it's being transmitted, but I don't have access to it and it's only being looked at every three months. So my device is failing, I'm in a remote area, I would have never put myself at risk had I had up to date real time information on my device. So, yeah. so these are the situations, you know, that, you know, the night sky. It's the same thing. They're trying to get real-time information. They need it now. 
and the technology is there. But the industry has not, and FDA is having a hard time, you know, figuring out how they're going to regulate uh, patient access to their real-time data. Kim, you bring up a lot of great points. One thing I want to add to that, because we faced a lot of the same things, and I'm kind of honestly tired of hearing, oh, it's just you. So this one token patient, whether it's Kim or Dana, we're right. not token patients. Um, and the other thing is the diseases that we live with, for example, type 1 diabetes, which I can speak to, it's inherently risky. You are sent home from the doctor's office with a lethal drug that can kill you. And even if you do everything right, you might still die in your sleep. Um, and that's a real risk that we live with. And so when we're talking about risk, when we're talking about regulatory approval of devices, when we're talking about this, we kind of need to get to a new paradigm where an individual can look and say, here's the potential risk and here's the benefit, and they can balance that against their personal risk and their scenario. But that's something I don't think is happening right now that we've got to see change. And I think with the access we have to data and with the ability to DIY device, we're starting to see some more of that conversation, but we really need to get to that realization, which is all of us living with these chronic diseases and conditions really are at risk every day already. And so, yes, I might have an extra 0.01% risk of using this device, but this extra 0.01% is actually a net reduction of 20% risk <laughs> per se because I'm actually using this device. So it's really putting things into the proper context and perspective, which I don't think is always happening. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I don't, um, the focus always seems to be on the risks, not the benefits. And I find that, yeah. I mean, you know, I have autoimmune and I've had autoimmune since I was 10 months old. And it's always, it's always, you're always scared to do the benefit. I mean, you, you know, everybody wants to stay in a box of what we're accustomed to doing and not break out of that box because, just in case. We see it with cancer all the time. You know, I have friends with cancer and if they want to choose to take a homeopathic something or an herbal something, they're told it's going to go against their regime. Don't do that, no matter how much good is out there. So we all face with these questions. But before we go on, I just want to welcome everyone to please feel free to connect with us on our phone if you want to call into the studio, 919-518-9773. Or you can come in on Skype. We'd love to have you that way. Computers, that's plural. 2K voice, and we also have a chat that's open. You're welcome to come in there, put your name, and you can ask questions in there as well. So who, uh, John, do you want to answer anything, add to what uh, Dana just said? So I think, I mean, what they, what they both said is, is correct, and, and what, what's next is, is just a continuation of where these communities of people that and voiced their need and fulfilled it themselves in most cases, right, continue to grow. So we're not seen as the individuals who kind of heard of the rules or, or had something. It was really, we're just pointing out the obvious need that we have and, and meeting it ourselves. And hopefully in turn, this shows industry and providers that there, there really isn't as much risk there as they believe in, in regulatory groups as well. So the risk is actually being minimized by by bringing these folks that have all, always should have been seated at the table to it and, and welcomed to it. So it's a, it, it, to me, it's just continuing down this path and, and staying involved and, and growing the communities around the needs and hopefully something like you know, the We Are Not Waiting banner doesn't have to apply just for Type of one diabetes, but can can be a very broadly used. I'm call. glad to hear that because I've been borrowing it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not um, condition specific or disease specific. <laughs> it's, it's human specific. So I have your permission. <laughs> Well, and the cool thing about this is it's a, you know, it's a hashtag. It, you don't need anybody's permission, and that's what I love about this space with open source, with hashtags, with these communities, is somebody can take it and make it their own or take it to a new community or take it to a new thing um, and just continue to pay it forward. And that's one of the things I love about Night Scout and this DIY diabetes space is it's a great demonstration of how something really incredible gets built when people collaborate and they pay it forward and they kind of link back to each other. And I talk all the time with Hugo Campos, who some of you may be familiar with. He well, also, Hugo. yeah, um, he has also talked about wanting to access his data from his cardiac pacemaker device 
Um, and you know, this idea of we are not waiting needs to be in the cardiac community, it needs to be in the rare disease community, it needs to be all these different places. And I think he always says, well, how can we replicate what happened with Night Scout and Open APS? And I don't think there's any secret recipe. I think it's just the right people connecting at the right time, but taking these promises of we are not waiting and using social media and open source to connect to people, but also making sure that knowledge is publicly distributed and shareable and just keeping those tenets. Because sometimes when you're dealing with chronic diseases, you've got a life, you've got a job, and then you might do some, this really cool thing on the side, and you may or may not be the person who can then take it and scale it. Sometimes you are, but sometimes you don't want to. And so putting it out there and saying, hey, if somebody wants to take this and run with it or make it better or do something different by all means, and I think that's kind of the spirit we have to get to where it's no longer about, oh, you have this idea, let me patent it, let me you know, create a company, let me make all this money off of that, but it's really everybody saying, like, I'm gonna put it out here, I can protect my intellectual property even if I put it out in the public domain, but I wanna put it out here so somebody else can learn from it, use it, be inspired from it, and it's really exciting to see more and more of that happening. So. Joyce, did you have something to add? Yeah, no, I mean, I just think the whole notion of a collaborative networked kind of team for health is sort of a vision for the future, right? And so what I think it's really interesting about it is one, it sort of flattens the hierarchy, right? It's sort of, because everyone has access to the network, it sort of takes out this notion that you have to be like a healthcare provider or a healthcare stakeholder or a, you know an industry person. But two, it, I mean, it, it absolutely sort of right, accelerated the innovation happening inside the community because it went from 40 members in 2014 and now it has over like 25,000 members across, you know, like 24 different Night Scout groups that are now global, right? And so, um, so I think that is the openness, the open, the open source code and sort of the social, this, this opportunity to have kind of a global network contribute to it is really, really important. I mean, they went from 10 features in apple pie to 152 in funnel cake, which was sort of the, you know, like if you go from A to F for all the for all the different builds in Night Scout, right? Like there's no sort of enterprise or company that could have ever done that, and that's that's the power of um, social media and collaborative networks. So I think you know healthcare is definitely not designed that way, right? It's pretty closed, it's pretty enterprise, and it's it's all about proprietary kind of information and and, and lack of sharing. But um, I think this is a really good lesson for us in the diabetes community about what you can do when you open things up. Uh, you know, lots of what you've done, I guess, has been a threat to the, you know, the powers that be or the structure that be. Now, Joyce, what you did was somewhat relatively simple on some level because, I, I mean, I listened to it and it was so cute with your son explaining because it made perfect sense. It was in his words and I heard him explain, you know, what's good for him and where where. I could understand what to do, to do to help him. So it's not, yours wasn't as much of a threat as a piece of equipment or Kim actually diagno, you know, figuring out what she had on, on her own. Is that, is that true? Yeah, I mean, I, it, there's this great um, blog post, I think, that Susanna Fox talks about. She's the CTO of um, HHS, the uh, Health and Human Services. But I mean, she talks about how technology is culture, right? And so, Typically, technology has been sort of in the domain of the device maker or inside the sort of the machine of healthcare, right? But now, when you have uh, mobile technology and you have individuals, you know, sharing code on GitHub, um, and you have a talented pool of people who want to pay it forward, right? The ability to create levels the playing field and removes the hierarchy. So I think it it's it's a huge opportunity, but I, I can see where, I mean, you know, early on in sort of in the history of the Night Scout community as it was growing, you know, people were called like helicopter parents and like, you know, cowboys, right? Because, because, because how dare patients like decide to try and do something as disruptive as this, right? So, you know, so with the technology comes the power, with the power comes a change in sort of who has a voice in the culture. And so, um, you know, my hope is that we can open it up and make it more of a level playing field. Um, but I think that the, the sort of stereotype of the healthcare enterprise is still pretty much top down instead of bottom up. Um, I have a lot to, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Kim. 
Oh, I would I would say um, it is still for sure um, from top down, but that is so is changing so radically. It, it medic medicine is probably the one of the last um, holdouts of of the being influenced by the digital era. But you know now that consumers have very powerful tools in there and and information, it's it's likened to the uh, Gutenberg moment in medicine where. You know, all of a sudden we had this flow, this open up of um, of information from the priesthood to the um, to the to the common people, and and it, and it radically changed the whole environment and, and gave forth to the Renaissance. You know, and and I think that's what we're facing today. Um, there is a uh, definitely kind of a pushback from uh, a, you know, I'm I'm often. I'm either celebrated as this new force in medicine and you know the empowered patient, or I'm the you know the a very dangerous hacker who who has penetrated the you know the priesthood and and I'm a threat. But um, it, it's interesting in terms of genetic. We have consumer direct uh, genetic companies such as 23andMe that the consumer can go directly and and get their, you know, get a, um, a bit of their genome sequenced at a very inexpensive price. And uh, I don't, you, you know, you probably all are familiar with the whole uh, um, Jolay, Angelina Jolay saga, which was, you know, like this nuclear fallout. It was even uh, classified as such, as though it was some sort of, you know, not radioactive fallout, but it was a nuclear fallout of the DNA in the sense that uh, because she had access, was given access and, and her data on, on the BRCA gene that she had, she under she took a preemptive, a very radical preemptive, of course, of having a, a double mastectomy. And she then advocated, you know, that, that at that point she had gone through the, the standard you know, procedure, the gene had been patented, the test for the gene had been patented, and so the, the company that owned the patent um, could charge an extraordinary high price for the test, and then they also uh, mandated that you had to have counseling. And all of these were really high cost um, items, and she had family members who she wanted to get tested and stuff who, who really weren't in that kind of a financial situation where they could have, you know, that they could afford that kind of testing. And so she was a real advocate of that, and and because of the public exposure on that, it was, it was seen as a real threat. The FDA actually um, issued them a mandate to discontinue, they had to, the 23andMe had to discontinue giving health-related information on their client's um, genetic information to the client. And this was, hmm, probably went on for about a year, year and a half, and there was just like this public outcry. And I, and I ended up kind of being an example that was pointed to all the time as, as to what a patient actually can do with genomic information. Um, in the in sense of, of bettering your health outcomes and, and whatnot. And um, we, I, I was given the very unlikely position of co-starring with Angelina Jolie in Dr. Topol's new book called The Patient Will See You Now, The Future of Medicine is in Our Hands. And, and he speaks about this whole uh, Gutenberg moment in medicine where, you know, we are obtaining the power through information now to totally up in the hierarchy and um, and hence the title of the book, The Patient Will See You Now instead of The Doctor Will See You Now. But it, it definitely is the future. I, you know, it's like the music industry and all the other industries that, that got upended by the by the whole, you know, democratization right. of, of um, the internet. Uh, Dana, I want to, while, um Kim was speaking, it, uh, it occurred to me to ask you this question, and it's also on the chat, but based on s some of what Kim was talking about, the, the this technology, how affordable is it for just any family? Are you talking about family? the artificial paint yeah, technology? Yeah, or any of the open source, how, how it's being created, how yeah, affordable it really, is it? 
really good question because what we're doing is leveraging existing medical devices. So it's your existing insulin pump, your existing continuous <coughs> glucose monitor. The early versions of Night Scout, which John can also speak to, we had to use either like an old laptop to upload data or then it was an Android phone. And so the cost was an extra Android phone and a data plan. But that has actually progressed away to where you can use your just normal CGM receiver and get your data to the cloud, which is great. And the same thing with the artificial pancreas. It used that existing technology, and first you just needed this extra Raspberry Pi computer, but you could build an artificial pancreas for under $100. And that technology has continued to evolve, the hardware has, where the size has gone down now. So this is actually my artificial pancreas right here. You know, it's the size of a, a Tic Tac box, so to speak. Um, and again, it's, it's small computer parts for less than $100. Um, but what's really emp empowering is that people s donated their time and showed how to use these devices. So you go buy a computer on Amazon, you go load it with an algorithm that's open source, you put it together and you say, communicate with my medical devices, and that becomes the artificial pancreas. Um, and it's really significant to think about the cost of this because the artificial pancreas that's going to come to the commercial market it's going to be an all-in-one device. It's going to be FDA approved. It's going to have years and years of clinical trials and testing. There's a lot of reasons that that is a good thing, and that's why the traditional process and yada yada, that's a good thing. But what people don't understand, that device is probably going to be six to $8,000 out of pocket. But what we're showing is there's another alternative for people who want to DIY. It's not for everybody, but for those who do want to build it themselves, they can build something like this for maybe around $100 on top of their existing medical devices. And that's a huge game changer to show that this off-the-shelf commercial hardware, um, non-proprietary hardware, it's just basic computer pieces that are used for all kinds of projects, can be used in conjunction with your medical devices. And it, I'm really excited to see what else people will do outside of diabetes, having seen how we use a Raspberry Pi, how we use an Intel Edison for things like this, because the possibilities are endless. It's just a matter of saying, how do we want to use this computing power? How do we want to take data that we know is on our medical devices? And if we can get access to it, the possibilities are kind of endless there. Uh, Amnon has a question for you, Dana, but I want to ask you one thing before he goes. How many of those devices are out there? <laughs> That's a good question. So it's important to distinguish that this is DIY. Everybody makes their own. Okay. So no two devices are exactly alike. Um, I kind of roughly keep track. I ask people if they're building an artificial pancreas based on the open APS design to let me know when they're done and they've got it running. And as of this morning, there are 97 people around the world, both kids and adults, who are wearing open source artificial pancreases, which is really amazing. Wow. Um, I, I want to ask this. Is this actually an artificial pancreas that will inject insulin when it needs to or glucose at other times or is it just waking you up when you need glucose? Really good question. So what I talk about with OpenAPS is what's called a hybrid closed loop artificial pancreas, but it's not even an artificial pancreas. It's not replicating all the functions that your pancreas does. We're talking about it for diabetes. And what the system does is it takes data from your insulin pump, it takes your glucose data from your continuous glucose monitor, runs it through an algorithm and says, here's what your blood sugar is going to be. And in order to adjust it, either up or down, here's the amount of insulin more or less you need. Now, that's the same decision anybody with diabetes would do. You would say, oh, my blood sugar is rising. I need more insulin. How much more do I need given everything that's going on? Or vice versa. And what the system does is it gets that data in real time and runs the decision every five minutes and then sends a command back to the insulin pump to automatically adjust the insulin dosing. And so the beauty of the system is most people with diabetes think, okay, well, it's not too hard. It's, it's burdensome, but it's not hard to make that decision. But when you're sleeping, you're not decision-making about your blood sugar, you're sleeping. So mm -hmm. this system, while I'm sleeping, can say, oh, your blood sugar's dropping, you need a little less insulin, and it actually sends a command to the insulin pump, reduces my insulin dosing, reads the data back, adjusts the algorithm, and does that over and over again throughout the night. So if I start dropping, it lowers my insulin level and my blood sugar slowly comes back up. If I start to have a rebound and my blood sugar starts taking off like that, it reads that data, gives me more insulin, brings my blood sugar back down. So it's automatically adjusting in my sleep. And so that's what we mean by an artificial pancreas, is something that is automating the decision-making process and the dosing of the insulin. Again, using that existing continuous glucose monitor, which is getting the blood sugar data from my body in real time, and then using that existing insulin pump that's attached to my body already. Okay, so this 
requires a pump that monitors glucose all the time too. Well, you can use any continuous glucose monitor. There's a couple out on the market right. right now. You can use the one that's combined in the pump, or you can use one that's separate. But that's kind of the beauty of OpenAPS as a platform. And if anybody's interested in the technical details, I encourage you to go to openaps.org to start reading about it. But the idea is that it's a platform. So you can take any compatible insulin pump, if you can find one, your continuous glucose monitor of choice and build the system however you want. Mm -hmm. Like I said, there's no two systems that are built exactly the same because some people say, I want this thing to run every one minute. I want it to run every five minutes. Oh, I only want it to run every 30 minutes, maybe. Or I want it to do it this way or that way. I want to use this algorithm or that algorithm. So it's really a platform and an ecosystem and this idea about automating in real time. And it's less about you know following this laundry list of instructions. It's really more this idealist platform, and then people go off and build it themselves. And there's a couple of reasons why it's that way. Number one is safety. So because it's not FDA approved, it's not been in exhaustive clinical trials, you have to understand what you're doing. You have to make conscious decision after conscious decision that you want to close the loop for yourself. And like I said, not for everybody, but you have to make decisions and show that intent and say, yes, I am trying to build a system to automate my insulin delivery. And that helps keep you safe because you're not just saying, oh, I'm going to test this thing that I don't understand. You have the personal responsibility to say, I'm building this thing, and it's up to you to decide if you're going to learn to understand it or not before you use it. But that's a, that's a personal choice. That's a really important part of this DIY element is nobody's forcing it on you. You are buying these pieces, spending a lot of hours putting it together, and automating your diabetes decision making if you so choose. Okay. Thank you. I'm not happy now. <laughs> Thank you, Dana. Uh, John, I want to ask you since we have this question out on the chat, if you if you could provide just a quick overview of what diabetes is and how tricky it is to monitor the blood sugar, because I think we didn't talk about it, but it probably is a good thing to mention. Sure. So, so people can understand it better. Yeah, sure. So with, with type 1 diabetes, it's an autoimmune condition where, where your immune system has begun to attack your pancreas, the beta cells in your pancreas, and deprives your body the ability to produce adequate amount, amounts of insulin to, to regulate blood glucose. So in the absence of that, you have to begin dosing and using synthetic insulins and and doing a basically that whole negative feedback loop in your head until until Dana and folks come along with their open APS to take some of that burden away. So you're it's this you have to really recognize everything you eat and how it impacts your blood sugar. The, your mood can impact blood sugar. So we see, you know, before Evan has a soccer game, his blood sugar will go up because he gets excited, and then after the soccer game, it'll start to, to drop because muscle is far more efficient at pulling in insulin than, than, than other cells. So it's this dance of 20-some factors that you that you sort of manage on a day-to-day -day basis. And not enough insulin, your blood sugar goes too high, you're going to end up hyperglycemic perhaps in a long term that can be devastating to your body. Uh, there are many complications from high blood sugars over time and also the immediate risk of ketoacidosis and diabetic ketoacidosis can, can be you know, fatal. And on the opposite end, if, if you have too much insulin, and your ego hypoglycemic, if you don't manage that, that, that can also prove fatal. So it's this dance between these lines all day, right? You want to stay in this healthy range. And I think Lane, Lane Desborough, who, who early on sort of pulled me out of, out of my small town and, and, and brought you know, my pieces of Night Scout out into the open, he had a great, I think it was a paper he wrote or an article he wrote or a blog post, where basically saying that every few hours in the life of type 1 diabetes, your, your life is put in risk. So you have many, many opportunities on a, on a daily basis to harm yourself by incorrectly 
counting carbs incorrectly, um, dosing insulin, it becomes very challenging. And for parents of children with type 1, you effectively have type 1, other than not actually living with the condition, you are responsible for this child with this very complicated disease. And it's, it's very, very burdensome to, to parents and to siblings. And because it does, it pulls a lot of focus. There's a lot of tasks, daily tasks in the hundreds if, 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 you're, if you're counting. And any, any tool that, that, that can help reduce that is a huge benefit. So, so it is, yeah, complex and burdensome would be the two, two key terms I would use to describe it to folks. And then, then on top of that, there's the, the emotional weight of it all, and concerns about burnout and depression and, and all these things that sort of come along for the ride. So everything that, that I've done has ultimately been focused on, on Evan, and I've just been fortunate to find folks that, that encouraged me to share and, and, and did far more with, with my little pieces than, than I ever would have. So that focus has always been to reduce that burden for Evan, you know, for his sister, his mother, and, and myself. So, so that, that's, that's sort of what triggers a lot of, a lot of this work is, is because diabetes is inherently dangerous and it, yeah, it's just it's, it's a challenge even with with an open APS system things still still go wrong even if there's a lot of points of failure in, in, in this in managing this condition either with the devices themselves or with, with, with the data you're receiving so it keeps you on your toes no matter no matter what it, it's daunting because yeah. it's so individual. You have to have, it's almost, and I'm being educated, obviously I'm being educated as each and every one of you just breathe information into this show. But it's daunting because so much of this is so based on an individual experience. There cannot be one piece of anything that's going to work. And with, all, and, and with everything going on and all the, the allergens and the thises and the thats, I mean... We have got to be the master of our own health. We've got to. We have no choice. There is no choice. Well, a good example of that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dana. No, go ahead, Kim. Um, so I have kind of a different, but very similar situation. I have implanted in me a, um, a defibrillator, an automatic defibrillator, and I'm prone to sudden cardiac death, episodes of sudden cardiac death. And generally, I... Um, have breakthrough events when I'm um, out exercising and I am an athlete and if I was able to get my real-time data and to actually monitor my heart rate I can see there there are tail signs of when I'm very vulnerable and I'm going to you know I'm at risk for a, um, a breakthrough event which is life-threatening and uh, I can, I now have, there's digital technology, I now have a, um, what's called an Alive Core heart monitor, and I ride with that, it's on my iPhone, I ride with it on my bike. Um, the problem is, you know, I have to stop to take my EKG, but it, it also, uh, it's not sophisticated enough to really pick up uh, ventricular tachycardias, which is the life-threatening type of arrhythmia that I have. It's really um, made to pick up um, uh, a, a less um, uh, dangerous arrhythmia and atrial um, um, uh, tachycardia. And uh, so it, it's not sophisticated enough, yet my device is, but I can't access that data. And, it, and if I could, I would um, be in, in real time, I could really monitor and manage my risk a lot better. But on top of that, as John said, the device in and of itself can fail, and there's problems with that. And there are, um, 
it's being monitored. I mean, the, the device diagnostics is, is the technology is there and it's being monitored. It's not being looked at. It's only being looked at every three months and, and it's being done remotely. The clinic picks it up. I have no idea that I'm, you know, that I'm not um, actively downloading my, my device's information. I used to. I used to put a wand over my um, device and I would hook, hook it into a telephone line and it would actually transmit um, data from my device to the clinic. Now it happens with seamlessly. I, I don't have to do a thing. But the thing is, is that there really isn't anybody on the other side monitoring that. And every three months, they do. And I don't have to go to the clinic, which I used to. But, but every three months, they do. And I get a charge of um, $700. And, and it's, you know, that's, it's really difficult. Um, it's, it's, it's expensive. Hugo Campus um, has unplugged his. He refuses to share his data if he can't see it himself, <laughs> which I'm, um, I also just unplugged mine as well. But, but the technology is there, but we can't, we can't access it. Well, we if, can't access So if the, if the technology is there and you can't access, and, and I'm not a technology person per se, but if the technology is there, and you can't get it from one source. Can you get it from another? Can you? Well, you'd have to hack the device. And I, I think, Dan, is that why Hugo has has contacted you? And you know, do you have conversations with him on that? Yeah, he's he's always said he wants to find somebody with the technical ability to sit there and partner with him so he can hack his device. But it's mind-boggling to me that. We, as patients, still have to hack our devices to get our data. I would love to see devices designed. And, and, and some of the pushback I get is that, well, not every patient needs this full access of data. You know, you're the 0.01%. You're that patient who wants it. That's great. But 99.9% .9 of people, you know, don't need or want that access to the data. But my pushback is there's no reason why there shouldn't be a super user menu that I, as a super user, I'm willing to push the extra buttons to go the extra layer and get access to my data. But that should be a de facto part of the device is enabling the patient to see their data. But just like Kim talked about earlier, um, and there's people out there talking about how devices are designed to give data back to the company and then back to the doctor, but very rarely to the patient. And that should be totally redesigned so that it is my data. I own my data, so it should be patient first then the clinician, right. then the cloud, the platform, the company, whatever. Um, but we really have to push manufacturers to be willing to basically flip that paradigm around because that's not what's happening today, but that's what needs to happen in order for this to happen. And then we also have to recognize the timeline of medical device development. What's being put on the market today was designed five, six, ten years ago when this idea of patients having a right and the ownership of their data, that wasn't really a common thing. So we have to push and say every device coming out needs to have that, but also have a little bit of flexibility with the companies realizing that what's coming out today was designed years ago. And so it's kind of this balance of I want to have the patience because I get it, um, but there's th still things we can do to push the companies with software updates, with other tools that they can create to enable us as patients, even if we're super users, to push the extra buttons and to get this access to our data because there's no reason we shouldn't have it. So that takes us to Joyce, right? Because you're like the bridge, Joyce. Isn't, <laughs> that, isn't, that, your, isn't but, that your doorway um, in now? Because you are that doctor to design. You've got your new type, that new title. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I just wanted to um, mention. So, for example, I think uh, diabetes has like historically been a more self-managed disease. But like, I remember talking to a pathologist who was saying that people didn't even think that nurses should be doing monitoring, and then it was revolutionary for like patients to be doing monitoring at home, and then. You know, now there's things like CGM and even now the DIY devices that exist. So I think there's always going to be like a movement towards, you know, I'm hoping that there's more movement towards sort of patient centeredness in the in the access to the data and in the um, and in the management. But I think it's take it's taken like many years for this to happen over time. Um, you know, it's interesting. So one of the device companies that has probably the most kind of pumps used by patients with diabetes across the country. Like the irony is that it does provide a patient view and then a physician view of the data. But then the irony is that the physician view of the data is actually much more comprehensive and provides all these extra statistics 
um, than the patient one, which is the total opposite of what it should be, right? Because if I see a patient once every three months, like I don't need all that data. They need the more comprehensive report. So like there's definitely anecdotes of like individuals, like really like upstanding professionals who have to literally go to their clinics, their doctor's clinics to get the doctor downloads so that they can have access to the information, the more comprehensive information they need to get to do their decision making. And I think that's that's truly a shame, right? So that's why I'm very supportive of <clears throat> I think all of the activities that have been happening inside of Night Scout. Um, and in a larger community that's trying to just bring uh, uh, a leveling field to sort of who is a stakeholder and who, who deserves access to data. Um, but I think the other thing that's really funny is like, ironically, we also see our patients every three months, right? And um, I do think that there's a bell curve, right? And there's certainly lead innovators. And I often walk into a clinic room and I say, okay, I'm going to give you an A1C, which is basically the three month measure of glucose that we do every three months. and. Um, you know, sometimes that's all I can do. All I can do is like read off the the results, and honestly, they're like running the show, and I have no insight or um, or extra sort of expertise to offer, right? And then there's other individuals who um, who need the three month visit because that's that's a way for us to stay connected about the diabetes. But I think generally, what we want is we, you know, I think the whole notion of healthcare happening inside clinic is going to be decimated, right? A lot of what we do in diabetes is three month visits and probably that's going to change hopefully soon whereby if patients have access to real time data and if we have more virtual communication like I do think to a certain extent um, a better support system and better technology can kind of make the endocrinologist to a certain extent obsolete so 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 Joyce what do we do so what do we do um, so I think we support I think we support the participation of patients in many arenas. I think one, we import the innovations that they've created. I mean, you can talk about the technology that's been created inside of Night Scout, but then there's also really interesting innovations that are happening with regard to like, this is how I dealt with my insurance company, or this is how I created the forms to work with school and the nurses, or this is how I work with my endocrinologist, right? There's also like different innovations in terms of um, uh, like, different ways of managing diabetes that maybe don't even involve like the devices but just like patient developed insights into what works better i mean we have this problem in that we always kind of we cater to the lowest common denominator so we say here's a log book here's a pen and a paper right and here's a, a vial and a, and a syringe for insulin right so like I, I do think that like as we move more towards personalized medicine we do have to give like the broad array, and you gotta be able to sort of meet the needs of the super user who wants to start on a artificial pancreas from day one, and you gotta be meeting the needs of individuals who don't want a lot of technology, right? But I think what happens right now is we homogenize um, our care delivery, and we make it too watered down, and we make it too average, such that we're not really meeting the needs of our patients on either end. Um, but I think, you know, number one, including them in the healthcare infrastructure and or including them in the conversation is probably the first step because they're often not represented, right? So if there's no patient stakeholders in the room as you're doing quality improvement, as you're talking about making changes to a, to a clinic or clinic policies, um, like having them in the room really makes a difference and really provides you with a new perspective that helps you sort of shape, I think, a more patient-centered view of how healthcare should be delivered. Well, just knowing that there is a conversation that people can partake in is so important People don't even know where the conversations are or that there's people talking. So, you know, all the work that you're all doing in your own areas, your own perspectives is extremely valuable. So, um, John, uh, did you have anything else to add to that, Kim? i uh, not Kim. Um, I'm sorry, Joyce. Joyce. No, Kim, go ahead. No, I want to oh. ask you one more question, though, before you go. Make a movement. Just tell us just a little ditty about that, because that's really important, too. Yeah, so it's um, a movement that's happening. I would say, like, its origins probably historically, there's a lot of activity around the Bay Area. Um, and there's an organization called Make. So essentially, there's a lot of sort of technologists, hobbyists who, who like to, it's a do-it-yourself technology movement where you sort of learn by um, doing and then you sort of do collaboration of communities so you either go to like maker fairs where you sort of showcase things that you've built and or um, you kind of join maker spaces where there's other community members trying to build things and what there is is sort of a sharing of 
knowledge tools and technologies. And so essentially, like through the research that we've been doing with um, Night Scout, um, like that's essentially a maker community, right? There are individuals, patients and caregivers who are tinkering, developing new different types of technologies, right? And then they're um, sharing it with others and there's kind of improvements, tweaks. Um, and so really supportive of it as a, I think a model that um, levels the playing field for creation, right? So doesn't say that like you have to be a physician in order to create, doesn't say that you have to be a device maker to create. It says that like patients and caregivers actually should be doing the creation are probably the best people to be doing the creation because they understand the problems most acutely and they understand which problems need to be solved. So, um, so I would say it's sort of a it's a movement that's very bottom up. If you think about DIY or if you think about Open APS, I think that's sort of a perfect example, right? Where where the code is available, there's instructions, there's components to buy, but but what's happening is that people are sharing knowledge in a very bottom up way to be able to build their own systems. And so I think it's a fantastic model for thinking about how to incorporate patients more centrally in um, healthcare delivery. Like if we did the maker movement inside healthcare, we would automatically assume that all patients and caregivers are designers and or makers. And so then it would op give us an opportunity to sort of engage them in a much more active way to inspire us to kind of change all the horrible things that we're doing inside healthcare. Just give that website again for the maker um, movement? Well, so ma ma you can look up, you can Google like Make Magazine, or you can just look up the maker movement. Okay. I mean, I think it's this notion of like now people can write computer code, now there's Raspberry Pis, like tiny little computers that are really cheap, there's 3D printers, right? There's just basically all sorts of technologies that are now available to the masses um, because of, I guess, Sort of innovations of where we are now with computing and with with manufacturing okay thank you very much for that and kim why don't you give yourself uh, tell everyone where they can find you and some and the special work that you're doing yeah, with the design so, yeah. um for a couple of years um i was introduced to um the scientific community through dr eric topol who is a is a very well-known um sort of like the expert on the future of medicine. He's the medical visionary, uh, the digital aficionado, aficion, how do you say it, aficionado? Aficionado, <laughs> thank you. And anyway, um, so that kind of opened the doors for me and I became the voice of the patient at, at many professional forums. And I've you know, given a lot of keynotes for um, offering the, the voice of the patient to to the industry and to medical professionals, but uh, what's always missing again is the patient. It, we have to convince not only the medical community, but we have to convince the patients that they really are a vital part of creating a future of health made by us. And so I've started a, um, I'm, I'm just in the early stages of um, a campaign and it's called Rovo Real Wars Force for Health. And if you, uh, you can find it on Facebook and Twitter. And um, we're raising, we're doing a crowd rising campaign. We're launching next week and it's to fund the, the initiative. And it's, it's a um, public awareness and a, and a DIY health solutions initiative. Um, we're going to be trying to, you know, I'm going to be trying to bring the, the maker movement, the DIY patient to our communities, the, the patient, the peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, uh, that's what's really missing. I, I, I can't believe how many people have no idea about, you know, the maker movement. They have no idea about their power as a patient, what they can do, um, how they can really affect huge change. And um, so that's kind of what my mission has been, um, because I want to empower millions of others to do what I've done for my health. Um, and mind you, I was in a wheelchair. Um, I'm today walking, I'm spinning like the wind on my bike, and uh, it, it's been remarkable. I'd like to share how uh, we can really, you know, healing is real. It's, it's not necessarily going to happen through uh, drug therapy. It's going to happen at a very fundamental level 
of the food we eat, the air we breathe, the water we drink. It's, it's you know, every cellular activity is, a, is, a, uh, is mediated by very fundamental things in which we kind of lost our connection with, um, with food and uh, the idea of food as medicine. And uh, I have done everything. I have totally, um, I've not only attenuated, but I have reversed much of my disability. Uh, I was in incredible pain. I have no pain whatsoever. My um, predisposition to sudden cardiac death has absolutely stopped. I mean, I just don't have any arrhythmia anymore. And it's all been diet based. So I, I want to bring that to the community because I think we're, we're only given pharmaceutical options through the medical system. And, and we have so much opportunity to reverse uh, chronic disease conditions. And, you know, we're looking at the third generation of uh, fast food, and, and it's a disaster. 54% of our children today have a chronic disease condition that has previously been associated with aging and bad lifestyle yeah. habits. Well, Kim, and, let me, I, Kim, I got to interrupt you just a minute because yeah. we're going to be out of time. But before, I want to get to John and I want to. Sure. Um, ask Dana as well, but I do want to say that your episodes are fabulous, probably the most, one of the greatest documentary type of things I've ever seen. They're fabulous. Oh, they get the point you. across, they're fabulous. And you offer a tremendous amount of hope and inspiration. So, you know, it's kind of like I say, if you could do it, anybody can do it, not putting you down, but the point is, if any, Absolutely. if all of you can do what you're doing, anybody can do it. That's the point. I know that if I... If whatever I do, anybody can do it. I'm not that. I mean, why why would I be the only one? So hold on to that. So, John, what about you? Uh, to, to, to echo one of the things Kim said about, about diet and the food we eat and how important it is to, to manage your chronic conditions, particularly type 1, I think, I think there's a lot of ground still to, to cover there. And, and a lot of our great outcomes for Evan, first of all, he's very agreeable to that to everything that we feed him. But being able to get a really healthy food has, has greatly improved the overall health and blood sugar level. So there's a there's a key diet component in there that I think deserves a lot more research and exploration. Um, addition, additionally let's see I mean, there's there's so much that 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 we can do. I mean that personally. I'm excited for the future, and then as Joyce said, you know, it is this bell curve, and then there is no one size. It's all going across the patient population. You know, and just my my first year at the at the med center here, seeing the diverse needs and and exactly how to meet them across that distribution of people um, presents a presents a big challenge. But it only speaks more to, to what 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 Dana and folks do as far as enabling and showing that, that this sort of work can be done by, by any individual and if not by that individual by by hopefully someone close to them or someone in the community you know to, re to really address that need. So, so I'm looking I'm looking forward to bringing more tools in and, and really democratizing them further further so so the things we do for Evan aren't exactly the things that other people in our, in our community need. So, so hopefully we can continue to push on there and, and continue to show the value of collecting this data and really look at the burden of, of that data collection and then, and then overall really continuing to stay patient and caregiver focus. So, so other reported outcomes from, from these folks become very valuable and don't seem to be disease Specific necessarily are absolutely important and can be powerful predictors of, of overall outcomes and success in, in managing any of these conditions. So just well, keep, on, keep on working and trying to help as many people as we can. And I am just grateful that, that uh, I'm able to continue to contribute in any way I can. And, and I hope. Folks know that if they have an idea, they, they should share it. And and early on in, in this journey, I got a lot of folks 
commenting that I should patent this, that I should commercialize, you know, these remote monitoring systems, but that was never going to be the, the best path to take to enable folks to, to benefit the way that Evan and my family has. So I hope folks understand that we really want to change something. There's a lot more meaning and gratitude and just happiness and, and sometimes just giving things away. John, I'm, I, I thank you and, and I'm going to go to Dana now, but I do thank all of you again because I'm happy I'm in your hands. I'm happy that the four of you are out there blazing this trail, you know, that you're, you know, doing the things you're doing for your children and for the rest of us. So I really, I appreciate that. And it's, it's, it's important that people get this, get this message. So Dana, what about you? Well, just to wrap it up and echo a lot of what the others said, it's just so important to do what we call pay it forward in the Night Scout community. You know, I wouldn't have been able to close the loop had John not for sure his code, had Ben West, who's a key part of both Night Scout and Open APS, had dedicated years of his time to helping us figure out how to communicate with devices. There's so many people who have contributed, and they didn't do it for pay. They didn't do it for publicity. They did it because they were intellectually curious or they wanted to share something with somebody else so somebody else could go do something interesting. Um, so just to echo what, what John said is I just challenge people to share your idea, put it out there. You'll never know the ripple effect of what you do until later, um, but it's just, it's so powerful and we need these innovations and we need everybody to be out there making, doing, sharing, because that's what makes the world a better place, but it also makes an immediate impact on our lives. And so I'm just so thankful for everybody who's done that and want to challenge everybody else to, even if it's something small, even if you think it's only going to help five other people, that fifth person may be somebody who can then reach another 500. So it doesn't hurt to put it out there. Um, so I just challenge people to do that. And um, for people who want to learn more, check out We Are Not Waiting. Check out nightscout.info for more information on Night Scout and then openaps.org to see more about Open APS. Perfect. And, and, and that was a perfect way to sum it up because sometimes you're, you're living with something and you, you, know, you, just, you need it, a, a, a technology tweaked a little bit you know, based on your lifestyle. And you don't realize that that's, that little thing is the same thing that somebody else is dealing with, whether it's about waking up in the middle of the night, whether it's about your child playing a game, whether it's something emotional that has to do with something. You don't know. And when you get an opportunity where you're hearing from these brilliant people about sharing that, that thing that you take for granted that may not be fixed, share everything, talk to somebody, find somebody, and there are people out here that are going to listen. So with that, we're going to be posting the show so the rest of you can see it. Did somebody have a closing remark? Anybody? Okay. I want to thank you all for being here and for, for sharing with us and taking your time today. And everyone out there, take take us up on this offer of sharing the information because what you have is valuable. If I can be of any support, please let me know at Marilyn at MarilynShannon.com. And I want to thank each of you, Joyce, Kim, John, Dana, for taking your time today and sharing. So with that, we're going to go and we'll see you next week. Bye. You're attuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Omnon Nissan, My Life, My Will with Gisela DiCarlo, The Tanya Love Show, Help Then with Debbie Brook, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Triangle Be Well with Howard Jacobson, Lunch and Learn with Rabbi Yisrael Cutler, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, Current Affairs with Omnon Nissan, and if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.